the 21st of November, 1917. Across the whole of Britain, the church bells were ringing. After three terrible years of the Great War, there was at last a clear-cut victory. Fast, emphatic, and won at little cost. The British Third Army had broken through the German line to a depth of five miles and taken 10,000 prisoners. The Bells were also celebrating something more than what seemed to be the first victory in years. The British had used a wholly new weapon of war and on a grand scale. The Bells were celebrating the triumph of the tank, which had won its first battle. The tank proved to be a tremendous uh, psychological weapon. They terrified the Germans. For the first time, because they were used in numbers, uh, the British Army was able to make the kind of penetrations which could have only have dreamed in the Battle of the Somme. After two years of fighting, both the soldiers on the Western Front and the population at large really needed a boost to their morale. Two years of trench deadlock, huge casualties and huge sacrifices meant that the tank gave a signal for hope. And the Battle of Cambrai was the beginning of that hope. But then the attack ran out of steam. Days of stalemate set in. And then on the 30th of November, just 10 days later, the Germans delivered a stunning counterattack. The British lost 6,000 prisoners and all their gains from the first day. Snow started to fall and the battle petered out, a miserable and bitterly disappointing draw. We can ask the question, is the uh, Battle of Cambrai was a success for the, the British? I think that the Battle of Cambrai was a success of one day. After the Battle of Cambrai was like all the other battles, terrible, uh, disastrous and uh, lost from uh, everywhere. Cambrai is one of the great might-have-beens of the First World War. Each side won a great first day success but each side was unable to follow up and exploit that success. It was an odd battle too. Odd that the British started it in the first place. They had just ended a long and exhausting battle at Passchendaele with over a quarter of a million casualties. The whole army needed a rest, not another offensive. There were, however, urgent pressures on Douglas Haig, the British Commander-in-Chief. Only a few days earlier, the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, had publicly expressed his and the British Cabinet's frustration over Haig's apparently futile attacks at the Somme and Passchendaele. Haig badly needed a victory to save his own position, and the nation needed one too. Haig's career was on the line. He knew that Lloyd George was coming for him. He needed a victory. It didn't have to be a big victory, but it had to be a victory where the church bells were rung throughout England. The other pressure on Haig came from some of his officers who thought they now knew the formula for success and were desperate for an opportunity to try it out. This was the element of surprise, new artillery methods and tanks. Surprise is always crucial for victory. Everyone knew that. But for infantry now to penetrate the barbed wire and machine guns, a week of artillery bombardment was necessary. And this made surprise simply impossible. By late 1917, however, British gunners had learned how to fire accurately at targets straight from the map, with no need for ranging shots. The guns were pre-calibrated, so if the batteries were secretly bought up at night and hidden from observation, complete surprise might be achieved when they opened fire. This still left the barbed wire, 
for a few hours of shelling would never cut it. And the wire on the new Hindenburg line was from 50 to 100 yards deep. To counter this, a new weapon had been developed, the tank. Weighing 28 tons, these steel monsters could crush their way through the wire. Under normal circumstances, barbed wire is no problem to a tank. It simply drives into it and squashes it flat. And normally, in doing so, will leave a path adequate, at least, for the infantry to follow. They pick their way a bit, lift their feet up, and they can step across that without any trouble. Their six-pounder cannon and Lewis guns were designed to destroy German machine gun nests, which had previously decimated British attackers. The gun is a 57 millimeter. We would call it six pounder in the British Army. They tended to use Nelsonian terms when talking about guns. It was really intended in the first place for taking out what we would call hard targets. That would be pillboxes, enemy vehicles, and that kind of thing. The problem was there weren't any, not really on the Combray front. You could fire high explosive at machine gun positions and strong points of that sort. But since the real target was human beings, the tanks with the machine guns were actually far more valuable. New artillery tactics in the tanks made surprise possible. And these three together made victory possible. Many people contributed to the development of the tank. The single most influential person, however, was Winston Churchill. What you're looking at here is the very first tank. It's known as Little Willie, which apparently was a, an unkind name for the Kaiser. And what makes it outstanding historically is that it was designed under the auspices of the British Admiralty. The army had nothing to do with this. Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty at the time, impatient with the way the war is going in France and convinced there's better ways of doing it, gets his people, the Director of Naval Construction and a team of inventors, to come up with a solution. And at the end of their period of doing this, this is as far as they have got. The prototype tanks and the original weapons were, of course, naval weapons. They were, they were pioneered by Churchill in the naval department. They were supposed to be land ships. But very quickly, the potential of these vehicles was recognised by anyone who had a head on their shoulders, and the army very quickly took control of them. After conversations with many people concerned to break the trench deadlock, the much-improved prototype became the model for the first production batch of tanks, the Mark I. The actual configuration of the tank is designed to get the maximum possible cross-country performance, irrespective of absolutely anything else. So the tracks pass clear around the body. In fact, the body's sandwiched between them, rather than resting on top as it would be on a modern tank. All of this for a top speed of about three miles an hour on a good day. So it's already crude, but very, very rugged. Small numbers of tanks entered the Battle of the Somme in September 1916. And more tried to surmount the mud of Passchendaele a year later. In neither battle did they have much success. But by autumn 1917, enthusiasts in the tank corps were certain they knew why. Tanks had to be used in large numbers, on firm, hard ground, and if possible, by surprise. By late 1917, the tank enthusiasts were becoming more vocal. Tanks had been around in numbers for over a year, but they had made no name for themselves. In the tank corps, plans for an attack therefore proliferated. And when the Battle of Passchendaele was finally ended, it was one of these for a large-scale tank raid near Cambrai that caught Haig's attention. The tank corps had been given the opportunity to pick their ground. The original plan had called for them to attack at San Quentin on a minimal operation. Get in, cause damage, get out. The plan was modified then later on, and in October of 1917, 
a plan that called for a breakthrough. This mythical breakthrough that we've been looking for since 1914 was going to be tried here again. It was beefed up to become a major offensive. It would rip open the German line, allow the cavalry through to exploit the situation, and force a big German retreat. The Battle of Cambrai was really conceived out of Haig's desire to appease the brain politicians, who after the Somme battles in 1916, after Arras, after Passion in 1917, really wanted a success that Haig, it seemed, couldn't actually deliver. And so Haig devised um, the plan at Cambrai in order to try and get the Western Front moving again. The area chosen for the attack was a five-mile stretch of rolling grass downland to the south of the old Somme battlefield in front of German-occupied Cambrai. The ground here was hard and there was no clutter from previous battles. It was bordered on each side by two large canals running parallel to one another, five to six miles apart. Though the left-hand canal was dry, they were both considerable obstacles and would secure the flanks of the operation. German fixed defences here were very strong, being part of the newly completed Hindenburg system. Three separate lines of trenches, two to three miles apart, were backed by a fourth in front of Cambrai. The trenches were widened to 14 feet across at the top to make it impossible for tanks to cross them. The British planned an attack with 474 tanks, 1,003 guns and seven infantry divisions, with five more divisions of cavalry ready to exploit the breakthrough. Having got the tanks and the infantry through into the German positions, we would send the cavalry through, like the hunt, chasing off into the far distance. And of course, they couldn't bear the slightest bit of barbed wire. So a number of tanks, and these were specially trained units, were equipped with these grapnel hooks, which they dragged around behind them and went through the wire and cut it. And it is actually quite incredible. The tanks would approach the wire in pairs. They would drop the anchor as they went through it, and it would pick up the strands of wire and drag them all together, and it twisted the wire into a kind of immense and powerful cord. It would snap, and then as soon as they were through, the two tanks would part company, and still trailing the wire, would set off in both directions until they had cleared a patch of, of um, ground wide enough for a regiment of cavalry to ride through. Because of the losses at Passchendaele, the British had very few reserves at Cambrai, just three divisions, and experience showed that fresh troops were constantly needed to maintain the momentum of an attack. For the tanks, there were no reserves available. Everyone had to go in on the first day. Shortage of troops also dictated an attack on a narrow frontage, just half that of the Somme, and attacks on narrow frontages were easier to seal off. And though the two canals would, to some extent, protect the flanks of the attack, one or both would eventually have to be crossed to achieve a breakthrough. And that meant capturing the bridges intact. The canals did actually lend themselves to natural boundaries on the edges of the attacking front. And what the generals tried to do, therefore, because these are major obstacles in themselves, is put special divisions, first-rate attacking divisions, in those areas to try and take them and mop them up. Preparations for the attack were meticulous. Planning officers in the area wore goggles and long coats to conceal their identity. False rumors were spread, and the tanks and guns were brought up by night. In the days preceding the battle, great preparations going on. Thousands of rounds of artillery ammunition, soldiers, all of the infrastructure needed to get these tanks forward and then at the very last minute the tanks themselves were going to come into the battlefield. They were going to come in at night. Their engines on minimum revs 
and they were just allowed to cover 800 meters per hour. Once in position they were covered with canvas which had been painted to look like brick and stonework and hidden away. For the tanks alone, five million bullets, half a million rounds of six pounder ammunition and over 200,000 gallons of petrol, oil and grease was brought up and hidden. Obsolete tanks towing sledges would resupply the attacking tanks on the battlefield itself. To cross the trenches, each tank carried a six-foot thick fascine, or bundle of brushwood, tightly bound with chains and weighing one and a half tons. The tanks were to advance in arrowhead groups of three, and at each trench, the first would drop its bundle, providing a step across for all three. For mutual protection, the attacking infantry were strictly ordered to keep up with the tanks. The tanks are there in case the infantry experience heavy machine gun fire or riflemen in front of them. And the infantry are there to protect the tanks when they come up against what we were going to find here on Fleckiers Ridge, some very determined German artillery units. At 20 past six on the morning of the 20th of November, a thousand British guns suddenly opened fire. It was completely unexpected, and the Germans were stupefied by the sudden avalanche of high explosive, gas and smoke. And then, as they peered into the mist and dim pre-dawn light, they saw hundreds of huge shapes lumbering slowly towards them churning through the wire, machine guns flickering at their sides. It was too much. In their hundreds, the Germans surrendered. The few who fought were killed as the tanks crossed, and the British infantry swept out of the flattened wire to occupy the trenches. By eight o'clock, as the sun was rising, tanks and troops paused to contemplate their amazing success. For very few casualties and with little trouble, they now occupied the Hindenburg main line and its forward trenches. They were now ready to go on to the third or support line, which had to be broken to achieve the day's two key objectives. On the left was Bourlon Wood and Ridge, which blocked the cavalry's exploitation of the breakthrough northwards. On the right were the villages of Marcoing and Masnières, with two key bridges across the St. Quentin Canal. The capture of these bridges was vital to get the cavalry across the canal and into the enemy's rear areas on the other side of Cambrai. By midday, they were almost there through the third line at several points and within three or four miles of Cambrai, where the French population rushed into the streets expecting liberation. The British tanks and infantry were working together. The Germans were retreating, their high command still trying to work out what was happening. But then there came two disastrous command errors. Here on Fleckiers Ridge, we're going to see, whilst the wider battle is advancing very successfully on either side of us, a hold-up, and the only major hold-up, on the Battle of Cambrai on the, the first day. One of the British divisions on the centre-left of the advance was the 51st Highland, commanded by General George Harper. Harper had no time for tanks. Consequently, he ordered his allocation of 70 tanks to attack in straightforward line abreast with what he called his little fellas over 200 yards behind them. General Harper's attitudes towards tank infantry cooperation wasn't really up to date, if you like, for the 1917 battlefield. He was rather skeptical about what tanks could in fact achieve. And he was fearful of actually placing his infantry in too close a support of the tanks because the tanks drew fire. He also allowed his troops 
to waste an hour when they took the Hindenburg line instead of setting off again immediately. The result was that when his force moved off to its next objective, the village and low ridge of Fleckier, the Germans had had time to put troops into the village and bring up artillery. The story is that the tanks get through the wire OK. The infantry are so far behind they can't find the gaps in the wire. I wonder about that. I mean, you can see where the tank has been. It leaves its mark. So I can't believe they couldn't have followed the tracks. The tanks then come over a ridge, and one after the other, they are shot to pieces by a German battery. What it's important to add is that during the 19th, uh, because some British prisoners have been taken uh, close from the wood of Avancourt, some of them mentioned about a tank attack in the area of Fliquier. And this is where the Germans had their, their concentration of, of, of artillery. And it was commanded by Lieutenant General Freiherr von Watter. And von Watter had actually trained his, his gunners to deal with armour. The British tanks, well in front of their supporting infantry, were then shot to pieces by these guns. Repeated hits wrecked 16 tanks in 20 minutes. After the tanks had been driven back, the Highlanders tried to advance on the village, but could make no progress. And with the village still in German hands, British troops to the left of the Highlanders had to halt their advance on the critical feature of Bourlon Wood the gateway to Cambrai and the countryside beyond. On the first day of the attack, there were no Germans in the wood. It was there for the taking. But that night, the Germans moved in, and during five more days of bitter fighting, the British would never completely capture it. To an extent, I think Harper has probably been used as something of a scapegoat with regard to the Battle of Combray. Uh, this was new technology after all, and he was conscious of the, the very high casualties that could result of men in the open exposed to high explosive shell fire. So you certainly didn't want to have your men grouped too closely around the tanks. And of course, history loves an easy to characterise villain of the piece, and I'm afraid that in many respects, Harper has probably become that. Meanwhile, a mistake of a different kind was occurring on the right of the battlefield. By early afternoon, British tanks had reached Marcoing and its vital bridge across the canal, and had occupied Masnier, although the bridge here was blown. The British, however, held several smaller footbridges over the locks, as well as the large bridge at Marcoing. All that was needed was cavalry to get across and drive into the German rear lines. But this did not happen. General Kavanagh, the cavalry commander, had placed himself and his forces well behind the lines at Fann. Here, he had good communications back to his superior, the Third Army commander, General Bing, but scant communications forward to the front. As a consequence, it was hours before he received news of the breakthrough. By the time the cavalry got moving and approached the canal, it was after three o'clock in the afternoon. One squadron of Canadian horse, a mere 120 strong, did get across and rode off into the dusk. The survivors got back to friendly lines the following day, having lost all their horses and two thirds of their men. The remainder of the cavalry, five divisions of them, rode right back to their camp to water and feed the horses. They had contributed nothing to the day's efforts. If anyone had had the slightest inkling of, of what could have been achieved, we would have had a completely different structure to the attack. There would have been reserves moved up much more closely. It, it came as a complete surprise that the German line was actually broken. No one expected this to happen. And it was, at one level, a squandered opportunity. Meanwhile, the troops and the generals digested their success. 
they were able to contemplate a five-mile advance on a front of six miles. The Hindenburg Line swept aside, more than 6,000 prisoners taken, more killed and wounded, and three German divisions mauled nearly to destruction. The cost of 4,000 British casualties made this a triumph, even by great war standards. The Germans didn't really have much opportunity initially to stop the British advance. They relied very heavily on the Hindenburg Line, and indeed so strong was the Hindenburg Line in that area that the Germans had relatively few troops deployed there to stop any potential British advance. Another reason for the Germans not perhaps counter-attacking sooner in the Cambrai area is that they relied very much on a system of defence in depth allowing the Allies, if you like, to exhaust themselves against the Hindenburg Line, giving the German time to, if you like, um, deploy new reserves from other areas. The night of the 20th of November saw furious activity on both sides. The Germans were combing Cambrai for any soldiers at all and hurrying them forward to improvised defences. On the British side, troops were briefed for the next day, while the tanks refueled, rearmed, and regrouped. Of the 374 which had actually attacked, less than half were available for the following day. The Germans were probably better prepared for the days after the 20th of November than the British, because the British had really put a great deal of emphasis upon getting a result in the first 24 hours of the battle. And of course, although the tanks did make a breach, they didn't break the German lines, and they didn't break the German army in the region of Cambrai. And as the British advanced, they lost their element of surprise, the lines of communication get longer, and of course their troops become increasingly exhausted. After the success of the first day, the second was a disappointment. British attacks went in at the two points where they'd been previously checked. On the left, the Highland Division found Flecquier abandoned by the Germans, but a line from Cantaing to Fontaine to Bourlon Wood and village was strongly held. True to form, General Harper did not wait for the dozen tanks allocated to him, but marched his troops out into the open, bagpipes playing at the front, where the tanks should have been. Shell fire immediately drove the Highlanders to ground, where they remained until the tanks arrived. In an hour, the Germans were pushed out of Cantang and 400 prisoners were taken. But that was the extent of the good news. Tanks helped push the Germans back in Bourlon Wood, but they could not penetrate into it. And without their help, the infantry could make little progress. The second British attack on the right around Masnières also gained little ground. The score of tanks allocated here arrived late and the German defences had been strengthened. Their machine guns now had armour-piercing ammunition and though tanks could take a surprising number of bullet hits, they could not survive indefinitely. This armour will keep out small arms fire on a good day. As you can see by the damage here, anything larger from a small caliber um, anti-tank type gun up to a field gun will simply smash its way through. There is example or spots here showing where machine gun fire has spattered and certainly dented the plate but not gone through. Here it is smashed through and some of these in fact can be followed through to the other side so that you can actually look in one side of the tank and out the other. The Germans had got over the shock of the previous day and had evolved methods of dealing with tank attacks. The, the German theory was that you just fired at the damn things. You fired everything you got at them. You throw bricks at them, if you like, because something might stop them. And, and so you just loaded whatever was available into the gun and fired it. Taking advantage of the poor visibility from within the tank, bolder troops also stalked them, throwing a sack of half a dozen grenades at a track to blow it off. In addition, the tank's return fire was only accurate if it came to a complete stop. When the tank is moving, 
the amount of vibration coming up from the track is such that you can't actually see anything at all through the sighting telescope, and there's a slot here for the sighting telescope. It'd be an absolute waste of time. You'd fire to make a noise and frighten people. At Cambrai, more tanks broke down than were knocked out. This was not surprising. At 28 tonnes, the tank was really too heavy for its engine, transmission and suspension. Unlike any modern vehicle where the engine has been completely separated from the crew, here the eight men in the tank are working around the engine. They're working in conditions that are almost primeval. Terrifically high temperatures given off by the engine because the exhaust pipes run straight up from the top of the engine out to the roof. The noise levels are staggering. So loud, in fact, that you can't hear someone shouting in your ear. And the gaps between the metal plates are so badly put together that concentrated machine gun fire would literally splatter in tiny droplets of white hot lead through any gap that you could find. The effect inside is suddenly in the darkness of the interior to see what appear to be hundreds of little sparklers flying about all over the place. Very pretty, until, of course, they start stinging your face. And then finally, there's the carbon monoxide. The engine manifold will leak carbon monoxide as soon as it heats up, and very soon, exhaust fumes are literally rolling through the tank. After as little as four to five hours combat, the crew of eight could be totally exhausted and violently sick. A rule of thumb was that a day's combat would reduce available tanks by at least a half each day, quite apart from enemy action. So after three days, virtually no tanks or crews would be combat worthy, though in a few days the number would rise again. On the evening of the second day, the 21st of November, Field Marshal Haig therefore had a difficult decision to make. His tank card had been played out, and so had the element of surprise. Was it worth going on? During the planning, He'd stipulated that he would review the battle after 48 hours and close it down if no progress was being made. This sensible proviso was directed at the politicians in London. There would be no repetition of the constant, futile attacks of the Somme and Passchendaele. But how could he close the battle down after the triumphant bell ringing of the first day? Where was the long-anticipated breakthrough? Surely the German army had been weakened. It had to be worth one more try. To improve his chances, he would use fresh troops from the Third Army's slender reserves. And he would attack in the only place that mattered, at Bourlon Wood. The unprofitable attack on the right flank would be ended. With the decision made, the next day, the 22nd, was taken up with preparations. An artillery barrage was planned. Fresh troops were marched up. The tank park combed for runners and crews. But there was an indication of German preparations, too. A hundred men of the Seaforth Highlanders had been left to hold Fontaine in a very exposed position. They were cut off by a sudden German attack, and their commander, George Harper once again, refused to send any help. The position could easily be retaken tomorrow, he said. The Seaforths were wiped out. The battle for Bourlon Wood and village raged for five days, from the 23rd to the 27th of November. On the first two days, the 40th Division, attacking in the centre and cooperating well with 20 to 30 tanks, managed to take the greater part of the wood. It cost them dearly, however, with 4,000 men lost in two days. Aided by a few tanks, some of the division also worked around the wood to gain a foothold on the edge of the village. But the tanks were too few and German fire too intense for them to hold on. They were also compromised by the failure of the 36th Division on their left to make any progress along the Canal du Nord, which exposed them to fire on their flank and rear. On the right, things went poorly too. Harper's 51st Division failed to take Fontaine, 
once again staying so far behind their tanks that the latter, which actually entered the village, were driven out again for lack of infantry support. Harper also, unaccountably, attacked with only two battalions, though he had four more available. There's a great deal of historical debate as to whether Harper actually made the correct decision during this period, but on the face of it, it's perhaps lucky that he did withhold some of his battalions because at the end of the day, literally on the 27th um, in the evening, they were going to be absolutely crucial in stopping the Germans as they pushed back towards Havrincourt Wood. The elite guards division replaced the battle-weary Scots, and on the 27th, probably the most desperate fighting of the whole Cambrai battle took place in Fontaine. As the guards tried to eject nine German battalions holding the village. By the 27th of November, it was evident that the British could not win the battle. The Germans now had seven divisions along an eight-mile front in the fontaine boulon wood canal du nord area, with more coming. Their artillery had reduced boulon wood to splinters of timber. In the air, too, the British were losing. The Royal Flying Corps had performed a valuable service strafing German positions at the beginning of the attack. But on the 23rd of November, Baron von Richthofen's formidable circus arrived from Flanders and the RFC lost its control of the air despite doubling the strength of its patrols. But if the British, having failed to breach the fontaine boulon line, were willing to let the first snows mark the end of the battle, the Germans had no such intention. At a conference held on the 27th of November, the local German commanders outlined their counter-attack plan to a very angry Ludendorff. It began the next day, with three divisions applying pressure on the northern fontaine boulon section of the British line. The British held on, but what came as a complete surprise at least of Bing at 3rd Army and Haig at GHQ, was the German blow at 6 a.m. on the 30th of November. Seven divisions struck at the base of the British salient in the southeast. Their intention was to slice northwestwards to link up with the northern attack forces, cutting off and destroying all British forces in the salient and recapturing most of the lost Hindenburg line they very nearly succeeded in their objective. The German attack stunned the British, much as the British had stunned them on the first day. Preceded by gas, high explosives and strafing aircraft, fast-moving groups of stormtroopers with grenades, submachine guns and flamethrowers swept through the British lines and were nearly halfway to their objective by 9 a.m. of the first day. The tank is not the ideal weapon for the defence. So this whole battle had really been structured and as an offensive attack. And the British forces were simply not geared to fight a defensive battle. So when the German counter-attack finally does fall, and it's a very well-constructed counter-attack, they're not really in a position to be able to resist as effectively as they might have been. Despite the confusion, the British command structure responded with commendable speed and efficiency. By early afternoon, two reserve divisions and the dismounted cavalry were fighting to retake the key village of Guzo Corps. The tank corps, on its own initiative, had scraped together 63 machines and, in the best military tradition, had sent them off towards the sound of guns. Having gained three to four miles and taken more than 4,000 prisoners, the Germans planned to renew their attack next day, the 1st of December. Six divisions were to strike again in the east and on the British right. The blow was planned for 9.30 a.m. But the British seized the initiative, attacking two hours earlier. Led by 16 tanks, the Guards Division stifled the principal German attack and though the British lost Masnières and could not hold on to Villers-Guidelaine after the tanks had taken it, by the end of the day, the Germans 
like the British, had failed to build on their brilliant first day's success. Fighting continued for several more days, particularly in the Boulogne area. But by the 7th of December, heavy snow persuaded both sides to abandon the battle. Cambrai is remembered today as the first tank battle in history. It was not the first tank versus tank battle, because in 1917 the German army had no tanks, believing them to be a waste of time. Cambrai proved them wrong. One of the other final results of the Battle of Cambrai is that the Germans have in their hands a great number of the British uh, abandoned tanks and for the first time they are able to start to collect them. 50 uh, of the 100 tanks in German hands will be put on train and then drove to Charleroi and with the 50 tanks they are going to make a small 30 uh, in running condition. Cambrai showed that properly used tanks could crush barbed wire, cross trenches, destroy machine gun nests and knock out pillboxes. Tanks could dramatically reduce infantry casualties and give assault troops greater confidence. The Battle of Cambrai, however, also demonstrated the tanks' limitations and weaknesses. They could not operate in woods, for instance, and in the close environment of a town, they required infantry support. They needed protection from artillery, and from stalking parties of infantry. They were too slow, too unreliable mechanically, and too exhausting for their crew. The tank, by that stage in the war, really wasn't a breakthrough and pursuit weapon. It was only uh, with faster, lighter tanks, uh, such as the tanks that the French were developing, that would allow breakthrough and pursuit uh, and really bring a, a, a war to an end by mobile means. In retrospect, I think the generals were quite clear that this was a transitional battle. They were, if you like, training for the great battles that were going to take place undoubtedly in the next year. They hoped to refine their fighting techniques, find out a little bit more about all arms cooperation, find out now what the tank could do against the strong Hindenburg line. Cambrai does change the, the face of war, but it is at the level of, of, of mythology. It is what people believed might have been possible, which actually gives them the political power to, to enable them to persuade their governments uh, to, to experiment with new types of formations, uh, with armor divisions, tank armies, uh, and so on. Tanks played an intermittent, but at times vital part in the victorious Allied campaign of 1918, particularly at Amiens on the 8th of August the black day of the German army. British tank units everywhere, however, still celebrate the 20th of November 1917, the anniversary when the men who bravely volunteered to try a new and unproven weapon of war are remembered.